Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this FTA Brexit webinar, the August 2016 update. Uh, you're very welcome uh, to this event. My name is James Hookham. I'm Deputy Chief Executive, and I will be hosting and chairing the event this afternoon. Uh, this is the second such webinar that we've conducted to keep members posted on uh, what we know about the Brexit process. Um, and our intention today is to give you an update on the various issues that we are aware of uh, and effectively let you know as much as we know about the uh, what is a very complex and convoluted process. But in response to events that have taken place since our first webinar back in July and also to the feedback we had from delegates that attended that webinar, uh, we are going to focus on two particular issues in the course of the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, that is an update on the implications of the customs union that the UK enjoys with Europe uh, and the implications of the various statements that were made uh, over the course of the past month or so by ministers and have a hard look at one of the most important trading markets for us uh, and their reaction to uh, to Ireland uh, to the to Brexit, and that is of course uh, the Republic of Ireland. So I shall be joined by my colleagues Paul Ambassador uh, in Brussels and Neil Macdonald in Dublin, uh, who will be sharing their thoughts with you on that uh, process. We will conclude uh, with a question and answer session, at which I will be joined by my colleague Chris Welsh. Um, and so we will be uh, hoping to offer you uh, everything we know on these various issues over the space of the next 30 minutes. Just a few house rules before we get going. Uh, could I ask you to keep your microphones and telephones muted to avoid feedback? Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available for download through the FTA website uh, in, a, in a, a couple of days' time, a couple of working days' time. Um, and the third point is that, regrettably, we won't be able to deal with any technical issues you have in terms of uh, following the webinar, so I, I hope the uh, technology is working for you. Uh, but we will, of course, be uh, open to your questions. Uh, and I hope that you've worked out how to use this on the uh, webinar interface, but please use the messaging board in order to input uh, your questions to us. Keep them as short and specific as possible. Uh, we will answer as many as we can as we go through through the interface, um, if not through the uh, question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And the, those which we don't have time for, we will provide an answer to and include those in, in the document that will be posted on the website um, in, in a day or so's time. Now, we understand that many of you are joining us for the first time on this webinar, um, in which case, welcome. We, we uh, will give you details of further webinars at the end of the session. Um, but just as a quick recap, um, and I think this is fairly evident to most people that are following the story, uh, the decision of Britain to leave the European Union will have a massive impact uh, on all segments of FTA membership uh, and the logistics industry in general. FTA has set itself the mission of leading on logistics uh, as far as Brexit issues are concerned. Um, and we have produced what we call our ABC guide to try to map out the main issues of concern to members at this point in time. We are using this as a, a selection of headings uh, under which we are tracking progress. And I will, in a short while, go through each of the items in that guide just to update you where we are. Now, as I said, this is, this is the, uh, uh, the second of a series of, of webinars that we are planning uh, to hold as the principal way of keeping members up to date on developments. Uh, we'll uh, share with you the dates of uh, future webinars at the end. Uh, but if you missed the first webinar, um, then please do have a look, if you wish, uh, at the address given, uh, download it from the website, and, uh, and, and catch up on what you missed. It's uh, perhaps an understatement to say that the political situation is very fluid. Uh, since our last event, uh, we've obviously had a, a, a new uh, ministers and new departments appointed by the new Prime Minister, Theresa May, um, and that very much reflects the new uh, challenges that the uh, government is facing in respect of actually exiting from the European Union. At the same time, uh, on the continent, there are new power dynamics uh, playing out, new politics playing out 
not least in uh, some of the major economies um, in France, uh, Germany, and, and indeed in Italy, um, where there are elections uh, either coming up or, or possible in the next 12 months. Um, and this indeed will change the landscape in which the uh, UK is negotiating. However, and as I think, as, as you know, the formal start of exit proceedings has not yet been commenced. Uh, the, the formalities of leaving the European Union are governed by a clause in the Lisbon Treaty called Article 50. And tr uh, Prime Minister Theresa May has made it pretty clear that she's not going to invoke that, as is her gift, uh, until at least early 2017. And there is continued talk that that may delay even beyond then. Now, even when that process gets underway, it will take at least two years to complete that exiting process. Uh, and so the first message that FTA has to its members is that as far as operational matters are concerned, there are no practical changes until those negotiations have been completed. And it is really important that uh, uh, members um, are, are not uh, beguiled by the suggestion that, they will, that now that we're leaving the European Union, none of the rules apply. They do, as do the penalties, uh, and the government has been quite clear uh, that nothing changes um, uh, in the interim. So uh, EU rules and obligations remain in force for now, and our message to members is suggested there is, is keep calm and carry on. Uh, we will certainly make it our objective to let you know when things do actually change. So as I said, FTA has attempted to put its arm around the various issues that Brexit raises for logistics, uh, and we've listed um, uh, a selection of issues we're particularly uh, anxious to track and to follow, um, and I'll very briefly re re uh, highlight some points here. Um, access to the single market is is, a, is the key, uh, the crux issue, but quite apart from our trading relationship, FTA is also following very closely uh, the consequential issues on this around uh, the free freedom of movement of people, and in particular, the status of EU workers currently resident in the UK and their eligibility to continue working in British businesses. And likewise, uh, the continued ability of employers in the UK to continue to recruit uh, non-UK nationals to work uh, in the UK. And that is, of course, an absolutely essential requirement so far as uh, the recruitment of drivers in particular uh, is concerned into the logistics sector. Um, border controls remain an important issue, although they are outside the formal Brexit process uh, the relationship between Britain and France over the juxtaposed controls in Calais uh, is playing out in a, in, uh, as we speak. At the moment, some real difficult situations there for members moving trucks across that border. Um, so we are keeping that uh, uh, strictly, uh, very carefully under review. Uh, it has been suggested it will become a feature of the French general election or presidential elections next year. But at this point in time, uh, none of the controls are, are, are being reviewed. And despite the pressures of migrants, there is no suggestion yet that uh, the, um, the borders are going to be relocated back to Britain. One of the main issues we're talking about in a little while is the customs issues, uh, and I'll introduce Pauline in just a moment. Um, unfortunately, we're none the clearer at this stage as to the precise timings of changes that might be made to domestic legislation uh, because of the uh, uh, revocation of uh, the European uh, directives and regulations. Uh, this will be a critical issue to, to many FTA members, uh, and as soon as we are able to provide more light on what the timetable for this might be, uh, we, will, we will let you know, um, because it may not simply be a, a, a cut and paste uh, exercise uh, into domestic law. There may well be some selectivity about which uh, laws made under European rules are actually reenacted under UK law. Um, and if that does take place, that will be critical for FTA to influence, and we will advise you accordingly. There's not much to say on enforcement, fuel duty, and global markets at this stage. Just to say our concerns around the implications for air freight as a result of Brexit are manifested in the decision that needs to be taken about expansion of airport capacity in the southeast of England. Um, now, whether that is Heathrow or Gatwick, we've made it very clear that a decision may to be quick, made quickly and take into account the needs of the UK to have a viable and well-connected international air cargo hub. In FTA's view, that can only be at Heathrow, and I think in most members' views, if you don't ship air cargo out through Heathrow, or indeed import it through Heathrow, 
And it's not a question of moving it to Gatwick. It will be a question of moving it to Amsterdam, Frankfurt or Paris. And that can't be a tenable option in a, in a post-Brexit world. Our second item that we're going to cover in some more detail is, as I said, the implications for Ireland. And the final uh, uh, item on that list, just to complete the elegance of the ABC, um, is our continued promise to you as members that you join in with FTA and you will stay informed and, as when appropriate, influential in, in shaping and informing this, this important process. So we will keep you updated uh, on Brexit under those headings. And what we've done today is to select two of them for further investigation and explanation. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Pauline Bastidon in Brussels, to take a, a detailed look at some of the customs issues that we're dealing with. Pauline. Thank you very much, James. Um, so indeed, we're going to have a look at the benefits of being in a customs union uh, with the EU, the pros and cons of staying in this union post-Brexit, and we will also look at the practical implications for shippers, logistics providers and operators. Um, so there have been quite a few recent developments uh, indeed over the summer. In July, you might have seen that the International Trade Secretary called for the UK to leave the EU Customs Union um, as soon as possible because that was felt to prevent the UK from uh, being able to uh, secure trade deals or the trade deals it wanted uh, with South countries. FTA reacted with a press release at the time warning government that this could actually create great uncertainty, uh, particularly for shippers, but, but not only, and had massive impact on exports and imports. Um, basically, leaving the customs union before a replacement solution is in place, uh, we feel is a bit premature. Uh, but we're now going to have a look, a closer look at what's at stake and longer term whether we should stay or, or, or whether we should go. Um, but first, the customs union, how does it work in practice? Well, today um, all the EU-UK trade is tariff-free and it requires very minimal paperwork, uh, almost as if you were in the same country really. Uh, the trade and customs arrangements with the rest of the world are defined at EU level. What that means in practice is that tariff levels for trade with the EU are set at EU level for, for the member states. Uh, that all the trade agreements are negotiated and concluded at EU level on behalf of all member states, including the UK. Uh, and that also means that the UK is bound by EU customs and trade rules. What is interesting to note is that already uh, countries that are not part of the European Union can be part of a customs union with the EU. Uh, and of course we can think about the example of Turkey, which has been in a customs union with the EU since 1995. But what is at stake for the UK? Well, the, the first thing, of course, is the freedom to adopt um, our own trade deals and, most importantly, to set our own tariff levels. As part of the EU Customs Union, UK companies can trade goods with the EU without rules of origin declarations or other non-tariff barriers that can create delays and bureaucracy. Uh, but, of course, this requires accepting the EU's tariffs on imports from the rest of the world and the control of this external tariff is necessary for signing new trade deals. Uh, it's one of the tools that you can have at, at your disposal when you negotiate such agreements. And it's a key part of the trade negotiations. So, of course, um, whether we stay in a customs union or not uh, would have an implication on, on this level of freedom. Uh, what's at stake as well is the competitiveness of British exports uh, towards the EU, but also other developed countries. The affordability of British imports, many UK shippers um, actually use material or, or products uh, that come from sub-countries, um, so obviously making these affordable is very, very important going forward. Uh, but it's not only about the quotas and the tariff barriers, it's also about the non-tariff barriers. Um, and by this we mean things like requirement to pay custom duties at borders, uh, to provide rules of origin declarations, to declare VAT prior to sale, and so on. All these barriers, which are not related to the tariffs, can count for about 60 to 90 percent of trade costs, uh, according to any research. So it's going to be pretty fundamental going forward. 
We can have a look at uh, the existing customs arrangements with the EU and uh, existing models with developed countries because these will give us an insight as to what could be a feasible option for the UK going forward. Of course, the most integrated model is to be uh, in a customs union with the EU. Uh, Turkey, as I said, is a, is a good example. The customs union with Turkey covers all industrial goods but does not address agriculture for instance, except processed agricultural products, or coal and steel products, or public procurement. So there are certain limits in terms of scope. Um, it sets common external tariffs for the products covered, meaning that, of course, the level of freedom uh, that Turkey, for instance, has is, is, is limited uh, in this field. Um, it forces the Turkeys to align to the acquis communautaire in several essential market areas, uh, notably regarding industrial standards. Um, tariff levels, well in general, uh, there are known, and there are no non-tariff barriers. So this is quite, if we go back to the previous slide, uh, please. Um, then you have the second range of agreements, which are free trade agreements, uh, the middle ground, if you want. The level of freedom, of course, is higher, um, but in terms of non-tariff barriers, uh, unfortunately there are some, and there are certain limitations as to um, products that are exempt, exempted from tariffs too, so agriculture and fisheries are in general uh, exceptions. One example of this would be the model uh, of uh, trade agreements that the EU has with Norway, for instance. Um, it's also fair to note that regulatory convergence is part of it, so Norway has to adopt around 75% of the EU rules. Uh, but when we talk about such non-tariff barriers, I mean, you have things like rules of origin, for instance, or export licenses and so on, which of course complicate things a little bit. And then, of course, you have the general WTO framework, uh, which provides a very good level of freedom, uh, but unfortunately, the um, tariff level uh, is, of course, much higher than, uh, than what it would be uh, under a free trade agreement. Uh, there are also quantity restrictions. Um, what um, WTO does is that uh, it prevents countries from discriminating against other WTO members. So you have the so-called most favored nation uh, tariff rate, which is the sort of base rate that would apply if you do not have a free trade agreement. And non-tariff uh, barriers, of course, um, are, are there, and they can be um, high, especially because there might be limited uh, regulatory convergence, for instance. Um, I was talking about sourcing from other countries, and of course that's um, developing countries in part. Well, there are three different types of arrangements that exist. The standard generalized system of preferences, uh, the basic condition is to be a developing country for this. The standard applies to around 54% of overall uh, preferential imports by the EU. And you have countries like India, uh, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, or Ghana, to give you some examples, uh, which would qualify under this. Uh, tariff levels with the EU are lower than the basic WTO rates. To give you an example, if you are uh, importing a shirt or t-shirt from one of these countries to the EU, the tariff would be about 9.6% of the price uh, instead of 12%, which is the sort of basic WTO rate uh, without these preferential rates. Um, and that covers around two-thirds of all product categories. Then you have uh, the GSP plus uh, type of arrangement. Basically, the conditions are the same as for GSP, but you also need, to, uh, as a country, to ratify and implement core international conventions uh, for human and labor rights, environment, or good governance. And that gives uh, to these countries full removal of duties, the same, the scope being the same as for uh, GSP. And then there's everything but arms, EBA. Uh, for this, the rules are a bit more stringent. You need to be on the UN list of least developed countries. Uh, Bangladesh or Cambodia uh, benefit from this, for instance. And it's completely duty-free and uh, quota-free as well, except for arms and ammunitions. So which elements um, should we consider? Well, FTA is now working on a shipper's checklist of trade barriers 
this exercise was led by my colleague Alex Beach, who is head of global policy for FTA. The intention will be to not only provide a checklist for industry and government, but also to propose measures to avoid or reduce trade barriers going forward. And it will uh, refer to very concrete case studies um, outside of the EU, of like Switzerland, for instance, and how they set up their own, their own trade deals, uh, that kind of things. Um, one element to consider, of course, will be do we stay in the customs union with the EU or do we go for a separate solution? Um, the UK will need to update its WTO membership, uh, particularly if a separate solution is, ch is chosen, uh, because currently all of this is done via the EU. Um, so that would represent um, quite, quite a bit of, of work. The UK would have to sign WTO trade facilitation agreement um, and accede it in its own rights, uh, for instance. And the UK, of course, would need to set up its own tariff schedule. Um, but we should not neglect non-tariff barriers, which are key, as I mentioned earlier, uh, such as infrastructure connectivity. We need to have good port capacity, uh, good links also uh, from an aviation point of view, so history will be crucial. Um, customs red tape and border delays will be uh, essential to keep to the minimum as well and country of origin rules for re-export to the EU, for instance, uh, will be important to look at to ensure that inward investment to the UK is encouraged. There are other elements that we are going to, uh, to look at, uh, and all of this will be part of our checklist. I'm now going to hand over to my uh, colleague Neil in Ireland, who's going to tell you more about options for UK Irish trade. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ireland obviously is one of the countries most impacted by uh, the uh, prospect of Brexit uh, as we are mainly a, a buyer of goods and services uh, but we have traditionally maintained a very large balance of payments surplus with the rest of the world but particularly with the UK. In the case of the UK uh, most of our trade, anecdotally, uh, is skewed towards lower value-added uh, products, and that's obviously, they are more susceptible to currency fluctuation. Um, since we split from sterling in 1979, we've maintained a, a, a monetary policy of trading from a weaker currency against the UK, and the real worry is that the higher exchange rate we're seeing now uh, will become the new normal. And if you see from the chart uh, that follows this one, um, since 1979, really until the Great Recession started in 2008, the the uh, Irish currency, whether as a, a, as the punt or as the euro, has traded below parity uh, or, or below the rate we uh, initially broke the sterling link at. Uh, for the last eight years, we've largely traded above, and if this becomes the new normal, it is going to have an impact on our trade with the UK. Now. Aside from the risks and issues that Pauline has been speaking about, but there are a number of these that are, are unique or almost unique to Ireland. Mm. As a country that enjoys such a large balance of payments uh, surplus, we do trade, we export a very great deal. And because of that, our international fleet it represents a far larger proportion of our fleet, uh, almost two-thirds of our fleet is international as opposed to just about 10% of the UK uh, uh, operational fleet. This will impact particular issues such as cross-border trade between the uh, Republic and Northern Ireland. It, it is taken as read that uh, Northern Ireland and Republic hauliers engage in cabotage. Uh, a lot of uh, hauliers in the Republic will say that Northern Ireland trucks don't even bother to, to cross back. The enforcement of cabotage has been a significant issue, always in the Republic. But what is going to happen in future uh, will only be clarified once we see the conditions of exit of the UK. Also, there's an issue, for instance, for uh, the fishing fleet, which lands a great deal of produce in Donegal and drives to Dublin or Rosslare through Northern Ireland. Um, 
when these vehicles are transiting a non-EU country, what sort of administration uh, can we expect and how burdensome is that going to be? Similarly, when we look at transit through the UK or deliveries to the UK, uh, at, at the moment, that uh, that's not a significant issue in an in administrative sense for Irish hauliers now. Will the administration of that become more burdensome? And if so, uh, will hauliers uh, pivot towards Rosslair Sherberg? Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, Ireland and the UK have since 1923 enjoyed what is, or, or put together what is known as the Common Travel Area. Uh, it's not established in Irish or UK law per se, but it is recognised by the EU treaties. And a key question once the Brexit negotiations are proceeding is if the EU 26 or 27, the, the countries negotiating with Britain, if they accede to retention of the CTA as it is now, will it be at the expense of something else? And if it is at the expense of something else, will our access to the continent uh, be affected? Now, there are a number of trade risks which are immediate, um, and obviously the ones which Pauline has already mentioned are the reintroduction of border controls, but also the reintroduction of customs uh, procedures, tariffs, and VAT. And Pauline glossed over the point slightly, but she did mention it. Even we have to be wary of a situation where there is a tariff, but the tariff is set at zero, because even the administration of establishing a zero tariff could mean, could impose a significant paperwork burden for hauliers and shippers. Um, it may also be that the UK will change their regulatory environment and that therefore Irish exports will have to meet both EU, EU and UK regulations. There has been much talk about social regulation in the UK. Uh, there is an extreme danger, I would have thought, of heightened competition in the UK market if, for instance, they depart from such things as the Working Time Directive. And all of these risks are most acute for the most price sensitive sectors, agriculture, food, drinks, and base metals. There are a number of longer term risks, trade risks, which aren't really possible to quantify at the moment. But for instance, um, a great number of the drivers employed by Irish businesses are EU drivers, but also quite uh, quite a number of them are non-EU from the Ukraine and South Africa. What, if any, will be the restrictions imposed on the movement of these drivers, uh, non-Irish drivers driving for Irish transport entities in the UK? We don't know. There is also, we've seen a lot of movement in the insurance market lately. Uh, if there are restrictions on UK passporting of financial services, the number of UK insurers selling products into the Republic could drop. Uh, I mentioned earlier on uh, the, the current volatility of sterling. Uh, if this was to become a, a long-run trend, that would have uh, severe negative implications for Irish businesses. Much of our the governing law for shipping uh, and admiralty law is English based. If if the UK does uh, withdraw fully from the customs union, are we going to have uh, a dual regulatory environment? And if so, there, there remains a possibility of our there is a likelihood of legal uncertainty into the future. An example of this would be that Brexit could trigger uh, what some of you may have in, con in contracts uh, known as material adverse change clauses where one party decides that the terms of the contract have been materially changed by some external event. On the longer term uh, 
still uh, we have the possibility that uh, if, as I already mentioned, the UK was to depart some of the social chapter legislation, you could have a situation where Irish businesses uh, might decide to relocate into the UK, uh, as we previously used to have haulage businesses relocating to Newry in Northern Ireland. Similarly, um, if the UK changes their public procurement or state aid rules, which they would no longer be bound by if they exit the EU, uh, will that make life much more difficult for Irish businesses tendering for UK contracts? Uh, as Pauline already mentioned, tariffs might uh, apply to energy imports, Irish energy imports from the UK. Um, all of this isn't happening in a vacuum and there is national contingency planning taking place uh, from the Department of Antishuk, but obviously that planning has, will only be reactive in nature and the contingency plans that are in uh, the, the, the contingency plans mentioned uh, will, will have to await what the shape of the ultimate Brexit agreement with the EU is. The trade issues uh, in the contingency planning are currently assigned to the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Enterprise Ireland. Um, and for example, one of the contingencies they have spoken about is is the possibility of reintroduction of export credit insurance, which was which was terminated about 15 or 16 years ago. The government strategy does say, however, that preserving the benefits of the common travel area is a key government priority, and obviously. We would, we, we would echo that and want to see that uh, uh, continue. Uh, and also the contingency plan does anticipate areas in which Ireland might enjoy an advantage uh, as a result of Brexit, uh, but uh, it, I think it's unlikely that our sector, transport, logistics, uh, would, would enjoy um, a, 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 any sort of material advantage from a UK exit. Uh, so th there are the current issues we have identified from an Irish standpoint with Brexit. Thank you very much indeed, Neil. Um, I hope members found that uh, those two presentations enlightening and, and useful. Um, it, it is uh, just after four o'clock, um, but I see we still have a significant number of um, attendees on the line. So. I think we'll have time for just one question uh, from those that have been submitted through the um, through the the, uh, the web platform, um, uh, and uh, I think this one's going to come your way, Pauline, because it refers to some of the customs procedures. I think you were talking about. Uh, Mr. Frank McGuinness asks: Will UK companies have to use the ATA carnets for exhibition goods travelling through the EU? And if so, will they have to uh, go through customs at each border? I guess that's a bit of a, it depends, doesn't it, Pauline? Well, precisely, that's what I was going to, to answer. It, de it depends very much on what kind of arrangements uh, we get following following Brexit. Um, I mean, for those who don't know, Carnet is basically a um, sort of duty-free and tax-free method of exporting goods on a, on a temporary basis. Uh, it's like a passport for goods replacing the normal customs documentation. Uh, and that's basically uh, if you, I mean, to 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 facilitate uh, the the transportation of uh, of goods uh, in certain cases. I mean, it's not needed obviously within the the EU, but it's 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 a it's a difficult one because it will very much depend on what kind of uh, of arrangement we get. So uh, my suggestion would be to come back to this in a few months once we have a better understanding of. Uh, the kind of arrangements that the government is favouring. Yes, indeed, and I, and I think, thank you for your question, Frank. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't been able to give a definitive answer, but I think your question captures the uh, the uncertainty for British business, indeed Irish business, because um, that clearly there will be cost implications, training implications for drivers, never mind back office implications uh, if the paperwork increased. Uh, so business needs plenty of notice if those changes come through. But of course our first position would be that um, movement of goods is as easy across Europe as it is now. Um, and that's, that's the ideal that we continue to need to press governments to achieve. But whether that is achievable within the restrictions on freedom of movement of people and all the other 
constraints that Europe might put in place, well, that has to remain to be seen. That is the, the um, heart of uh, the Brexit negotiations. So that and other issues will be those that we track and monitor as the process proceeds. Um, I'm going to uh, bring the webinar to a conclusion now, given that uh, we have um, exceeded our time. Uh, but please continue to submit questions either through the platform or, 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 or direct to us, um, and we will continue to, um, to help as we can. So thank you for your time. Um, just a reminder, this presentation, including the Q&A session such as it exists, will be available on the FTA website, well, probably not Monday, but Tuesday as a bank holiday here in the UK. Um, but please do continue to follow us through Twitter. Uh, we've got a dedicated website uh, for this uh, on the main website, uh, the address you can see there. And we will continue to post updates on the significant developments through the normal channels of FTA e-news. Um, which is weekly, and of course our monthly freight and logistics magazine. Our promise, as ever, is that FTA will continue to lead uh, for logistics on Brexit, and we will be using future webinars to keep you up to date on what we know. Um, and these are the dates we are uh, planning to hold those webinars right through to the end of the year. Should the pace uh, and the intensity of developments pick up, then we may well add to these. But at this stage, if you wanted to save these dates uh, in your calendars, they're all on a Friday mid-morning, except for the last one. Um, and uh, this will be the principal reporting points uh, for the developments as, as, as they emerge. So thank you again. Thank you to my colleagues, to uh, Pauline and to Neil in particular, and for the others that have, have uh, supported us in this. Uh, please continue to send in your comments uh, and your questions. Uh, just one final reminder, um, we are also featuring uh, Brexit in the Transport Manager Seminar Program this autumn. Um, so if you are attending those, uh, you will find um, an update on the, what we know there. Um, but uh, if you haven't booked yet the Transport Manager Seminar 2016, places are still available. Please do visit the website and reserve your place. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. I hope you found that useful. Look forward to speaking to you next time. Good afternoon.